It's tough. Brutal. Merciless. In all weather. Any time of the day. Anywhere in the world. Today, modern coalition forces have to prepare for a wide range of missions and operations. They have to be ready to fight in all conditions, at any time. At sea, on land, or even from the skies. This specialized training for combat is known as full spectrum warfare. Nighttime, total darkness, eerie silence, all is calm, a perfect time for an attack. Military tacticians throughout history have seen the advantages of being able to effectively attack under cover of darkness. It provided natural cover to attackers. Of equal importance, because it was seldom expected, it had a devastating physical and psychological effect on defenders. Historically, maneuvering large armies at night carried such risks that it was rarely attempted. But some armies used the darkness for their attacks. The Japanese, in particular, mastered the art of night warfare. They used it with much effectiveness against Allied forces throughout the Pacific. The only real option for defending forces was to fire paraflares into the skies. These rudimentary flares helped illuminate attacking forces giving the defenders an opportunity to strike back. But unfortunately, it also illuminated the defenders, making them targets as well. During World War II, the United States, Britain, and Germany worked to develop rudimentary night vision technology. The Germans, for example, developed an infrared sniper scope that used near-infrared cathodes coupled to visible phosphors to provide a near-infrared image converter. However, this device had several disadvantages, the biggest being the large and cumbersome batteries. The Germans also developed infrared technology for tanks, such as this Panther. The problem with infrared is that it requires a source of infrared light to illuminate a target. War in Vietnam. The Viet Cong were masters of night attacks. The American military turned to technology to help win the fight against the VC. Known as Generation One night vision devices, these new systems used light intensification to help locate enemy forces. Large, heavy, and somewhat cumbersome, they were still valuable on the battlefield. During the 1970s and onward, development continued into night vision technology. Both the Soviets and Western powers raced to develop better, lighter, and more capable night vision devices.
This included both light intensifiers and thermal imagers. The major test of these technological efforts came in early 1991, during the first Gulf War. The United States of America and its allies mobilized to force Iraqi military out of Kuwait in Operation Desert Storm. Night vision technologies were used by ground troops and major weapon systems such as armor, helicopters, and fighter aircraft. Targeting systems using thermal imaging technology, such as FLIR, were particularly important due to their ability to see through dense smoke, dust, fog, and haze at great distances. Today, almost all armor, aircraft, and special operations units are equipped with some sort of night vision device. Recent combat has continued to prove the significant worth of night vision systems. In fact, night vision devices are helping coalition forces to literally own the night. But it takes a lot of training to effectively use these devices in combat. Fort Benning, Georgia. One of the busiest bases in the U.S. Army. Every day, soldiers are trained for deployment to hotspots around the world. Recently promoted junior officers are learning the basics of urban warfare. The training is tough and exhausting, but their instructors have even more challenges for the young lieutenants. Tonight, they're learning how to effectively work using night vision devices. Captain Derek Draper is one of the instructors. Night operations are they're not necessarily more dangerous, they're just, it takes more planning because of the lack of light and the fact that you cannot see uh, your targets as well. Uh, it takes a little bit more planning, a few more fire control measures. Uh, once you get good at it though, it's actually probably a safer means of conducting an op. Uh, you have more signals that you can use. Um, our technology is, is such that really we do own the night. Uh, we have the ability to see things and utilize technology in such a manner that makes it pretty safe. Uh, it's just a matter of getting uh, all our soldiers up to speed on how to utilize the fire control measures and different technology that we have uh, to the best of their advantage. Night vision devices and the specialized training that goes with their use is helping coalition warriors to win battles, to help them turn the night into day, helping them to be ready for full spectrum warfare. Boarding parties, fit, tactical, and heavily armed. They are the warriors of a ship's crew. They are on the front line of danger. Coalition boarding parties combat terrorism at sea. One ship at a time. It's all part of the full spectrum of operations sailors can expect at sea. Uh, yes, sir. I have the mustard now. I have 18 personnel on the helo deck. I have two on the bridge and two in the engine room. Over. Boarding is one of the oldest methods of securing an opposing ship. Sailors have been climbing over the sides of enemy ships since navies were formed. For forces that lacked effective shipboard artillery, boarding was their main technique for ship-to-ship -ship combat. Many boardings are compliant and people are cooperative, but criminals hide among the law-abiding mariners. Terrorists, smugglers, pirates, people that don't want to have their cargo checked. It's a dangerous job. When you step onto someone else's boat, and they have hostile intentions, you have to be ready.
Chesapeake, Virginia. Lead, rear elbow, lead rear elbow, ready? This is where U.S. sailors learn maritime boarding actions and tactics. They call it VBSS. Visit, board, search, and seizure. They prepare for future deployments to hotspots around the world. The training is critical to their safety and survival. At the school, they spend a lot of time on physical training and defense tactics. Well, if, if you go on somebody else's ship, you're basically going into somebody else's house and telling them what to do and how they're going to do it. Not a lot of people like that, so you have to be ready to back up whatever you're asking them to do by force sometimes. So if you're not physically fit and you go in there, well, you, you can end up for a bad day. U.S. sailors learn the finer points of searching a ship. They use paintballs so they can feel their mistakes. They suspect trouble awaits them on the inside, but they don't know what. The training ship is purposely decrepit and dirty. That is reality. A lot of vessels they board are safety hazards. We train these students the worst case scenarios to get them experienced of how bad things can go very quickly. So we try to show them the absolute worst case scenario with downed men, getting shot at, uh, people dying around them. So when they do go on board, all the easy stuff comes like, well, this is easy day. We've, we've dealt with the hard stuff. This is, I can do this in my sleep. So, but when that hard stuff does come about, they already, they've already kind of been through it and they know how to handle it. They know how to, what the steps are to try to make it into their favor. Where are my friends? Do you treat my friends just like this? The skills they learn in training are perishable. They have to practice when they're back on their ships. The wall. While sailing in the busy, troubled waters of the world, boarding parties get a lot of hands-on action. All of the NATO navies have boarding parties. And when given the chance, they train together at sea. Even though their main job is to approach and board other ships, they're heavily armed. The most dangerous thing is the unknown. They know things can turn ugly fast. You step over here. Stop. Yes. It is truly the unknown. They go on, you know, they might be waving, hey, how's it going? And they're like, yes, yes, follow me. And they, they take them into a room, and all of a sudden, there's five guys standing with an AK, and they just get shot up. And things can turn very, very badly, very quickly. And yes, it has not happened too much. 99% of the boardings have been compliant, but it don't, I tell my guys it only takes one where it, it just can really affect the whole community on the whole boarding team just got blown up and killed everybody. It changes the mindset completely. Boarding party members are brave heroes in the fight on terrorism at sea, and it's all voluntary. They're motivated sailors who operate in every kind of condition on seas around the world. It's what makes them Full Spectrum Warriors.
Artillery is known as the king of battle, and for good reason. It's one of the deadliest weapon systems in modern combat, able to destroy an enemy force miles away. It's the long-range sniper. But traditional artillery is heavy and not very transportable. Today, technology has made modern artillery mobile, capable of being hauled beneath helicopters or even airdropped miles behind enemy lines. But it takes special training and soldiers to successfully conduct this type of artillery mission. Fort Bragg, North Carolina, home of the fiercely proud 82nd Airborne. The U.S. Army is training soldiers for future deployment overseas, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. One of those units deploying is the 319th Field Artillery. Some of these soldiers have never witnessed combat, never been under the pressure of incoming bullets, while having the pressure of accurately striking a target. So training has to be as real as possible. Colonel Chris Gibson is concerned for these young soldiers, which is why he wants this training to be as intense and real as possible. He wants them to win in battle and come home alive. Our brigade uh, combat team uh, currently stands as the global response force. And what that means is we're capable of deploying on little or no notice. In fact, as little as 18 hours, uh, we can deploy in support of any kind of emerging crisis. And after we conduct an airborne assault, uh, we're capable of conducting full spectrum operations on the ground, meaning that we can conduct offensive operations against a hostile force. We can conduct defensive operations in support of defending critical infrastructure, or we can conduct stability operations, not unlike you see overseas now in Iraq and Afghanistan. Today, massive operational exercises are held every three months, using thousands of soldiers, firing thousands of rounds, destroying targets, preparing for potential combat. These soldiers are a unique brand of warrior because they parachute from 800 feet to get to the battlefield, preparing for potential combat. One mistake could be fatal. And the heavy artillery is also dropped from coalition planes. Landing on the battlefield below and assembled within minutes, ready to pound an enemy with devastating artillery fire. These soldiers are proud to be a part of the airborne artillery. Staff Sergeant Michael Zell understands the importance of his unit how critical the artillery is to soldiers on the battlefield. At any time, there's people on the ground all over the world. And in the event that we had to uh, drop in, I mean, we're the only artillery unit that has airdrop capability. All these guys are young paratroopers that can, that have the motivation and discipline to jump out of an aircraft, hit the ground, not even think about it, and then go and place a 5,000 pound piece of equipment to uh, support their buddies that they may not even know downrange. And that's, that's very important, I think. Ah! We definitely do our part, that's for sure. We like to say we're the other army. We hold ourselves to a high standard. I'm not gonna say a higher standard, but we definitely hold ourselves to a higher standard. We uh, are motivated. It takes a lot of motivation and guts and uh, discipline to jump out of an aircraft at two in the morning and continue to do your job and not complain and, and do things like that. And uh, we hold ourselves to a higher standard and you get a uh, quality soldier out of this division. That's for sure. It's, it's, it's uh, absolutely effective. Uh, this is our sixth major joint forcible entry exercise over the last uh, year and a half. And these take months to prepare for. In the process of that preparation, we're prepared for any contingency. And then as we disseminate orders and rehearse, we prepare for what we call D-Day which is that day we jump in over Sicily drop zone on Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And uh, in, from that, we immediately transitioned into offensive operations. 
And so this has given us the opportunity to train on all of our critical tasks, and it's been very effective. So the airborne itself is as important as it is to the rest of the Army. I mean, uh, the artillery is uh, one of the staple backbones. If the infantry doesn't have rounds to uh, protect them down there, uh, then they just get annihilated after time. There's only so much they can do, and what we provide is that rear support that uh, really takes targets out. The 82nd implements it as that we can drop it anywhere behind enemy lines and uh, provide accurate fire in a 360-degree battlefield. I, I love the 82nd. Jumping out of planes is, I mean, the most, I get paid to do it. A lot of people pay to jump out of planes, and I mean, the Army blessed me with an opportunity of jumping out. It's an incredible adrenaline rush. Had an opportunity to go to another unit. I worked with other units, but I just, I haven't seen a high level of amount of training that, is, that has impressed me as much as the 82nd Airborne. Artillery is extremely important in war. It disables the enemy while protecting the good guys, enabling infantry and armor to get the job done. Mobility and speed, it's what makes airborne artillery ready for full spectrum warfare. Modern combat is swift and violent. It happens 24 seven in all conditions. Day or night, modern warriors have to be ready and adaptable to match the demands. Whether through specialized training, unique technology or weapon systems, it's all about being prepared for worst case scenarios. Ready to fight in full spectrum warfare.